let's go back to 1974 to the beginning of Dungeons and Dragons. If you were ever curious as to how the game was played at its inception, then we have one thing in common. I've created this OD&D campaign to capture the spirit of original Dungeons and Dragons. I'll be playing using the rules from the 1974 brown box, using only the three books, Men and Magic, Monsters and Treasure, and Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. And of course, Chainmail. I'll be sticking strictly to these rules to provide as closely as possible an uncorrupted example of OD&D gameplay. When making and describing rulings and events in game, I will be thorough so that you may get a good sense of how the original game should work. This will not be a reinterpretation of the rules as some old school renaissance game designers have done. This will be the rules. If you listen along, then my hope is to provide you with a precise example of OD&D actual play, which will provide a truly nostalgic form of entertainment, as well as a means to learn the game the way it was originally meant to be. As this campaign will be a solo experience, I will be using my own set of solo D&D rules, which have evolved over the history of this channel. If you are familiar with my previous content, then you'll have a rough idea of what to expect. If you are not, then don't worry. It will all make sense in due course. My solo rules will not interfere with or supersede in any way the original OD&D brown box rules. They are simply a means to run a true D&D campaign in a solitary fashion without a group and handle procedures for random dungeon and wilderness design. As the first booklet volume one Men and Magic recommends this campaign will be begun slowly and will be built naturally into something fascinating and unique. So, let's get straight down to it. Let the game begin. The first episode is an introductory episode. The characters will be created randomly with dice rolls, pencil and paper, and the initial world building will begin. The first thing I will need to do is populate my fantasy world with the playable characters. In OD&D, six ability scores are determined by rolling 3d6 and a further 3d6 multiplied by 10 to determine the starting number of gold pieces the character has. Let's roll some characters. The original game rules suggest a ratio of about 20 players for any single referee. That's a lot of characters to keep track of. To start, I'm going to roll up as many characters as I need until I have a balanced party, or thereabouts. I'll aim to cover the main classes to form a diverse adventuring party. This will likely involve some ability score adjustments in accordance with the rules given in the Men and Magic booklet. Let's begin. Character 1 Strength 12. Intelligence 13. Wisdom 9. Constitution 11. Dexterity 5. Charisma 12. Gold Pieces 90. This character's highest ability is intelligence, the prime requisite for a magic user 
As a magic user, the character will receive a 5% bonus to earned experience. The intelligence score also allows the character to speak three additional languages. A constitution of 11 determines an 80% chance of survival. With a charisma of 11, this character can hire up to four hirelings with a loyalty base of zero. A dexterity 5 means there will be a minus one penalty when firing missiles. I have chosen neutrality for this character's alignment. A D2 or coin toss will decide on this character's gender. Heads male, tails female. This character is female. Her name is Yazalda, the medium. Character 2. Strength. 9. Intelligence. 12. Wisdom. 11. Constitution. 8. Dexterity. 5. Charisma. 12. Gold Pieces. 150. This character's highest ability is also intelligence. But I already have a magic user. However, if I lower the intelligence from 12 to 10, it can be used on a 2 for 1 basis to increase strength to 10. Now I have a character with its highest scores in Wisdom and Strength, the prime requisite areas for a cleric. The character does not have a high enough prime requisite score to gain a bonus to experience, and due to low constitution, only has a 50% chance of survival. This character can hire a maximum of 4 hirelings with a loyalty bonus of 0, and has a minus 1 penalty to missile fire. I have chosen Law for this character's alignment. This character is male. His name is Lunis the Acolyte. Character 3 Strength 7 Intelligence 12 Wisdom 5 Constitution 9. Dexterity 13. Charisma 6. Gold Pieces 120. Our third character also has a higher intelligence score. I will use intelligence on a 2 for 1 basis to increase the strength to 8. This character is going to be an elf. Elves can begin as either fighting men or magic users, and freely switch classes whenever they choose, from adventure to adventure. This elf does not have a high enough intelligence to gain an experience bonus when adventuring as a magic user, and due to an even lower strength, will suffer a minus 10% penalty to experience when adventuring as a fighter. The character has a 60% chance of survival gains a plus one bonus to missile fire, and can hire a maximum of two hirelings with a loyalty base of minus one. As an elf, the character knows the following languages. Elvish, common, an alignment tongue, which will be neutrality, as well as the creature languages of orcs, hobgoblins, and gnolls. This character is female. Her name is Solaris. Character 4 Strength 11 Intelligence 8 Wisdom 12 Constitution 12 Dexterity 10 Charisma 6 Gold Pieces 30 our fourth character's highest score is Wisdom. We already have a Cleric, so I will opt to use Wisdom on a 3 for 1 basis, to increase Strength to 12. This character is going to be our Dwarf. 
there will be no bonus to experience for this character. A 90% chance of survival, no missile bonus, and a maximum of two hirelings, loyalty base minus one. The dwarf is lawfully aligned and speaks the languages of gnomes, kobolds, and goblins, as well as the usual tongues. This character is a female. Her name is Varley. Character 5. Strength. 9. Intelligence. 16. Wisdom. 10. Constitution. 8. Dexterity. 12. Charisma. 9. Gold pieces. 100. To round the party out, I'm going to use the intelligence on a 2 for 1 basis to increase this character's strength to 12. A 16 intelligence is a lot to waste, but with this sacrifice we can gain a halfling and therefore represent the full diversity of classes across the adventuring party. This character has no experience bonus, a 50% chance of survival, and can hire up to three hirelings with a loyalty base of zero. The halfling's alignment is law. This character is male. His name is Cade. I think five characters will do for the time being. It's enough to get the campaign started. Before these characters set out seeking adventure, they will need to purchase some basic equipment. Yazalda, the first level magic user, is carrying a dagger, a 10 foot pole, a leather backpack, two flasks of oil, 12 iron spikes, a week's supply of standard rations, a water skin, 50 feet of rope, a large sack and a lantern. She has 57 gold pieces remaining and will move at a light foot movement rate. Lunis, the first level cleric, is carrying a morning star, a leather backpack, a water skin, lantern, two flasks of oil, three stakes and a mallet, a wooden cross, a vial of holy water, and a week's supply of standard rations. He is wearing plate mail armor and has a shield. He has 29 gold pieces remaining and will move at an armored foot movement rate. Solaris, the first level elf, will begin the game as a magic user. She can wield any weapon, but can only wear magic armour. She is carrying a sword, a short bow, a quiver of 20 arrows, 50 feet of rope, a large sack, a leather backpack, a water skin, a bunch of belladonna and a bunch of wolfsbane, and a week's supply of iron rations. She has 31 gold pieces remaining and will move at a light foot movement rate. Varley, the first level dwarf, started the game with just 30 gold pieces. She did her best. She is carrying a battle axe and wearing leather armor. She also carries a water skin, a large sack, and a week's supply of standard rations. She doesn't have any gold pieces left and moves at a light foot movement rate. Cade, the first level halfling, is wielding a sword and wearing chainmail armor with a shield. He also has a short bow and a quiver of 20 arrows. He carries a small sack, a leather backpack, a water skin, six torches and a week's supply of standard rations and will move at a light foot movement rate. Now my characters have purchased their basic equipment and their encumbrance and movement speed has been calculated. It's time to build the world. The world is randomly generated using my own solo rules. These rules are constantly in development and I have written various articles to explain some of them. Visit solodungeoncrawler.blogspot.com for more information. Be sure to check back from time to time for further content. It is the 21st day of the month of Simavasonios, also known as the Time of Brightness. The Kingdom of Vaclavia has a temperate climate. 
Very little water runs through the land, just a scattering of small rivers and a handful of small lakes. To the southwest of the kingdom, the Sea of Wyennis cuts into the land in a narrow gulf, but there are no other coastlines in Verclavia. In the east of the kingdom, there is a scrubland near a large lake called Lake Luennan. On the edge of this lake is a small town called Terusia. This town is where the characters reside. The town has a population of around 5,300 people, mostly human, with other racial minorities being oppressed by the human majority. Instead of the usual streets, Terusia has a series of interlinking canals. It's a politically intriguing place to many, as the settlement is run by a syndicate guild of magic users known as the Oarden, who are overseen by a mysterious anonymous cabal, which the locals call the Unseen. The Oarden magic users often talk of a prophecy of doom said to have been handed down to them by the Unseen. The prophecy foretells a plague which will descend upon the Terusians, just like it did to the Cadians who once lived in a village to the east. The plague was a judgment from the Maker, the creator of all things, a punishment for humanity's abuse of magical power. The Oarden believe only in lawful use of magic. Some spells are outlawed and only humanity has been given the responsibility of wielding such power. Use of magic by demi-human races such as the elves and dwarves is outlawed in Terusia. The clerics believe in a different theology. To them, true magic comes directly from the divine maker to a chosen few, and all other magical practices are prideful tampering with chaos. This is sinful and will always lead to death. However, they are not here to judge the sinners, but live by example. The characters are currently at a campsite on the western shore of Lake Luennan. They are camping in the abandoned village of Cadian, which was abandoned several centuries ago due to the plague, which the Terusians call the Cadian Death. The party escaped a Terusian prison after being incarcerated for breaking the law. The story goes like this. An Oarden magic user was found out to be practicing chaotic magic in secret. He made a bargain with the guild. In an effort to save himself, he gave up Solaris, his secret elven student, who was very swiftly arrested and locked away with the dwarf Vali and her halfling friend Caed, who were apprehended for stealing a simple loaf of bread. Or at least that's how it seemed. In truth, it was a case of false identification. The cleric Lunis heard the sad story from a local merchant and felt he could not just stand by and let this happen. In an act of compassion for the innocent, he broke the dwarf and halfling out with the help of his sister, Yzalda, who had previously infiltrated the Order of the Oarden to further her own magical research. She agreed to get the guards drunk then stole the necessary keys to the cell containing Solaris, Vali, and Caird, who all fled the town together. They went to the one place where they know they won't be followed, Cadian. The characters cannot return to Terusia. They are now fugitives. The only way they can return is if they find proof that the Oarden are wrong and the Cadian deaf was not a punishment from the Maker for the abuse of the magical arts, or at least not in the way that the Oarden dictate. As long as the Oarden continue to rule using the prophecy of the Unseen to scare people into compliance, Terusia will always be an oppressive place to live, especially to non-human races. The party's plan now is to explore the Cadian ruins for anything that may help to dispute the claims of the Oarden. And for the time being, 
they will attempt to establish a base of operations here in the hope that someday perhaps Cadian may be restored to its former state and become a place of diversity, mutual respect and freedom. It is afternoon around three o'clock and the sun is high and hot. The party are rested after their escape from Terusia and they are now ready to explore the ruined village of Cadian. Stay tuned for the next episode where the dice will take over and the fate of the characters will be decided by random chance. This is where the adventure will truly begin. See you next session.